Good evening, everybody. It's six o'clock and welcome to uh, the series that we're doing on landmarks of New York uh, in conjunction with our exhibition, Skymarks Landmarks, which is up at the Skyscraper Museum now. Uh, it will, it, we are open on Wednesday through Saturday from noon to six with free admission. So I hope everybody will come down to the gallery to see the exhibition, uh, its ideas, and indeed the um, inclusion of the AT&D slash Sony building, uh, now known, uh, rebranded as 550 Madison by the new owners, uh, and the newest, youngest of skyscraper landmarks um, in New York City, having been designated in 2018. Uh, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the director and uh, curator of the Skyscraper Museum, and I'm going to give a short introduction uh, of our speakers tonight and of the kind of genesis of this program. Uh, and then I want to quickly get off the stage because we have, uh, I'm sure, a packed hour of history and reminiscences um, because our speakers tonight are two of the team that were the design team in the Johnson Berge office uh, when they got the commission and designed the AT&T building, the headquarters of then the largest corporation in America, um, one of the richest companies in the world, and the most plum uh, commission among skyscraper headquarters in the post-war era, one might say, since the Seagram building, where the architect Philip Johnson was uh, responsible, along with Phyllis uh, Bronfman at that time, uh, who took as a master Mies van der Rohe and uh, impacted the influence of the international style on the American skyscraper, um, along with SOM on Park Avenue and then across America. But shifting the stylistic emphasis um, away from the international style to a postmodern moment uh, and maybe a postmodern decade, if we expand that, was, you know, once again, this incredibly influential figure, Philip Johnson, immensely influential and also immensely controversial. But tonight we're just going to like reel back to the 1970s and 1980s when the commission uh, was uh, attained and when the design was made and revisit through the life experiences and reminiscences of both Alan Ritchie and Scott Johnson, and Scott Johnson being no relation uh, to Philip Johnson, uh, but uh, who uh, a person who worked in the office. So I'm going to give a very, well, a brief biography or, or a little profile of both Alan and Scott, and you'll understand why they're the perfect people to illuminate the, um, the moment of creation of the AT&T building, which is something we want to explore and archive uh, and in regard to the landmarks of New York. So um, Alan Ritchie worked with Philip Johnson for over 25 years and he became his partner from 1994 until Johnson's retirement in 2004. Uh, the firm was known as Philip Johnson, Alan Ritchie, and it's now known as PJAR Architects. Uh, Alan was the project lead leader for the original AT&T corporate headquarters, and he oversaw a team of design and construction, and he was the managing partner and the award-winning designer responsible for the implementation of many of the office's most important buildings, including many skyscrapers um, spanning the globe. Scott Johnson uh, is the co-founder and the design partner of Johnson Fain, an international architecture planning and interior firm located in Los Angeles. So he's speaking um, to us tonight from uh, LA. After receiving his MRH from the uh, Harvard GSD, he worked in the Architects Collaborative in Cambridge, Mass, and in LA and, and the San Francisco offices of SOM. And he's gonna tell us about how he came um, to New York, largely inspired by seeing uh, the, this new postmodern design by Philip Johnson. He served as a design associate for several of the firm's most notable high-rise projects uh, in the Johnson Berge office. And during this time, he also served as the assistant to Arthur Drexler in curating the three skyscrapers exhibition that Held in 1981. 
Joining Pereira Associates in LA in 1983 as a principal and design director, Scott uh, Johnson and William Fain, Bill Fain, uh, acquired the, now, the firm now known as Johnson Fain in 1988. In addition to designing nearly 100 built projects in the past 20 years, he is the author of numerous books on skyscrapers and other things, but including essays on the tall building and the city, uh, performative skyscraper, tall building design now, imagining the skyscraper and tectonics of place, which is a monograph on his firm. So um, I am going to show you a couple of more slides before I ask um, Scott to come onto the screen uh, and to give us a, a kind of overview of his understanding about where the firm went in the years before he arrived, um, and also then the postmodern years in which he participated as a as a design um, associate. And then Alan Ritchie, who was the project manager and really oversaw from the very earliest stages of the AT&T Commission, uh, was uh, in the room when it happened in, in, um, al at almost every decision point, uh, will uh, we'll kind of share his, his uh, entry into the project, as well as some of the um, stories um, behind the client and the uh, workings of the studio and other aspects of, of kind of, of the, the middle of the moment in the design and construction process. Mm -hmm. So um, with just these uh, few slides, I uh, want to make sure that you see how just how important this building was in the in the news, in the media, and in the architectural culture of New York. The front page of the New York Times on March 31st in 1978. So we're talking about the 1970s, even though the building wasn't completed until 1983. Uh, you'll see that slide again. Now, Johnson held an uh, unassailed position of primacy in the architectural community. And, um, and he was, as you can see by the cover of Time Magazine, where he holds up the model of AT&T, um, known across the country as the kind of leading figure of U.S. architects who were celebrated in before the terminology star architect began to enter the, uh, the, the lexicon. Johnson was one for sure. Uh, and in a wonderful review that was, or an essay really, by the really unparalleled uh, architecture critic Rainer Banham, who wrote in the Architectural Review in 1984, a, such a, an astute uh, analysis of the place of AT&T in architectural history in New York's um, skyscraper history that was so spot on with the moment, in, in the moment. Um, and we, I realized this when in our pre-call with, with Scott and Alan, they mentioned many of the things that they remembered um, that were one and the same observations that Rainer Madden uh, made in this, in, in this uh, kind of, a piece that has since been resurrected and reprinted in the Architectural Review. And so you've had time to read this wonderful um, observation that whereas the AT&T building's witticisms are expressly superficial, it is a work that in Manhattan, one must take very seriously indeed. Uh, and uh, both uh, Scott and, and Alan are going to reflect too on the reception of uh, postmodernism, the rejection of postmodernism by many in the critical community. Um, and I have already spoken um, too long, uh, and now I'm going to invite Scott to come onto the uh, screen. You do the honors. <laughs> okay. This is, of course, Philip Johnson on the right and his partner at the time, John Bergie. Uh, they were both very active. Um, collectively in the Office on Projects. They're standing in front of the uh, Times Square project. Uh, it was a big project. Ultimately, it didn't go forward in that way, but it was four major buildings at the intersection of Broadway and 42nd Street. And Philip, this is uh, in the studio with a number of the models. Um, Al and I were talking earlier. It looks like this was probably somewhere between 1983 and 84. Uh, behind him on his right is the, what's called frequently the Lipstick Building or 885 Third Avenue for the Heinz Company. And um, that was actually the last building I was involved in before I moved back to California. Uh, so that sort of puts a time on this. Philip would have been in his late 70s at this time. Next. 
Uh, maybe this is a, uh, Carol invited me to talk a little bit about the context for um, uh, the work, what brings us to the point in the late 70s when AT&T could happen and can also position, uh, you know, culturally, the cultural of architecture, where it was moving to, and also Philip's uh, resume in his own work. Uh, and I would just remind everyone, and maybe many of you probably know this, but we have to recall that Philip uh, was the founder of the Department of Design and Architecture at the Museum of Modern Art. He was also the designer of the garden, as most all of you know, a very modern, beautiful garden today. Um, he was, the, the show that he and Henry Russell put together was the International Exhibition, and that ended up being called the International Style. So in a way it inaugurated, now this is in the 30s, so this is depression, this is pre-war, uh, it inaugurated um, and invited a lot of European architects, uh, very modern architects into the museum and into conversation in cultural circles in America. Uh, and uh, that continued on after the war, uh, that modernism continued. Uh, Philip began to participate in it himself, not just as a, uh, you know, as a curator and a, a member. He was also a cultural figure, as Carol was saying, because he was, not only did he inaugurate that department at MoMA, but he was on the board. He was an art collector. Um, he ended up deeding a lot of his work to MoMA. So he was very much in the conversation about art and architecture and the modern movement. Um, so this, this is his house. You all probably are aware of it in New Canaan. Uh, it's really a landmark now. It was built in the late, late 40s. So we're now moving from the 30s to the 40s, a very simple, uh, quite lovely box rectangle uh, with a, a round brick core through the middle of it. And uh, so he was fully embracing and encouraging modernism, iconic modernism as we come to think about it. Uh, if we go to the next slides, let's see what we have here, Dan. Um, well, Seagram's building, as Carol mentioned, uh, he and Phyllis Lambert uh, invited Mies van der Rohe uh, to basically design this building. And Philip was an associate with uh, Mies on this. Um, I won't go into them, but as Alan, I'm sure, would share as well, uh, there are a lot of funny stories from Philip about which part Philip did and which part Mies did. And I won't go into them, but they were always with high humor. And, uh, and at times, Philip would just admit he, he just did the Four Seasons interior and that was all that he ever did. I don't think that was quite true, but that was said in, in good hu humor. But Seagram's building, along with Lever Brothers and before that, uh, the UN Secretariat building kind of shook and established modernism as a, as a style, if you will, of choice in tall buildings. It was so, uh, those buildings were so pivotal at the time and got so much attention that um, I'm sure Carol has written about this in her various writings, but in the, uh, this building would have come online in 1958. And by the early sixties, New York was redesigning its zoning codes to allow for single straight up vertical buildings. They could now be taller. They could have a 20% density bonus if they would allow a 40% uh, plaza, open plaza. So a sense, in a sense they were codifying the international style of tall buildings. And it's not too difficult to think back about Mies van der Rohe's glass towers on Friedrichstraße in the 20s, or to think about Le Corbusier's plans for remaking Paris with tall buildings and gardens. It was in a sense an extrapolation to America of that kind of building form in tall buildings. And you can look at Sixth Avenue today and you can look at every major city. They all redid their zoning as well. And uh, you know, tall, straight, modern buildings uh, were kind of kind of the thing of the moment. Philip continued on his own to develop uh, design buildings. We'll continue on here without Mies. Uh, IDS in the early 70s was one, and uh, it had some serrations. It was a uh, serrated shape, but it was an all glass building, a very iconic piece that fell into a glass atrium. And beyond that, he had uh, other buildings. Uh, Dan, we'll go to the next. Uh, very iconic was Pennzoil Place in Houston, and this would have been in 74 through 76. Two um, trapezoidal shapes that are pushed together with a 10 foot slot between them. Uh, very iconic, very modern. Uh, and you can just see right next to it building that occurred just a few years later, Republic Bank Center. 
Uh, here's another shot of uh, a straight on shot of Pennzoil, but you can see the difference between what was an iconic modern building and something that became much more postmodern, as we call it. Uh, and that brings us to AT&T. Um, AT&T, and Alan will talk about it in detail, uh, just sort of changed everything in the moment. Uh, I would just remind everybody, the audience, that um, you know, in 1966, uh, Robert Venturi had written Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. It was a Museum of Modern Art document. Uh, it uh, intellectually and culturally was a very interesting piece of writing about in integrating historicism and narrative, uh, even humor invention within a historical frame framework. And there were architects with smaller practices doing some of this, but it had never really landed on major buildings. Um, Philip was by this point uh, kind of a cultural impresario in addition to being an architect that was well known. And uh, he brought it uh, to the AT&T chairman and the board and Alan will talk about that, but I'm gonna bypass that and go just to complete the conversation about the few years before and after. We go to the next slide. There were other buildings right in the immediacy of, of AT&T, which continued with this idea about historicism in tall buildings, a building in LaSalle in Chicago. Next slide. Uh, Republic Bank Center, and you can see Pennzoil next to it. And right across the street, of course, and there's now a very um, historical building. Um, I remember the day Bob Stern walked into the office and said, oh, I know where that's from. You just read Henry Russell Hitchcock's book on 15th and 16th century Dutch gables at all of those buildings, you know, all the serrated top. Bob was probably the smartest uh, historic scholar and has remained so. And he was good at, at, at identifying all the sources for, um, for these buildings that occurred in the few years following AT&T. Uh, we go to the next slide. Uh, there was uh, 580 California for the Heinz Company, again, across from Bank of America on California Street. And it again was a stone building with apertures and openings, column, uh, in, uh, column intervals, uh, all the things that had a mansard roof, which you can't see here, but it had all the historical elements of prior buildings. And next. And then uh, just a couple more buildings here. And then it seemed to me that uh, in the years, few years thereafter, uh, Philip sort of engaged a kind of hybridization of some things that were historic, that were literal, and some things that were modern. This is PPG's headquarters in Pittsburgh, of course. And, you know, the finials and the profile at the top, you know, Westminster Abbey, the Parliament House, Charles Berry, and all of that. It's clear that it's coming from that, uh, the faceted vertical lines, but it's an all glass building. It's very iconic. You can see it as a kind of one one piece uh, of kind of modern language, although it references uh, a specific historical building. Next, please. Uh, 101 California, again, a solid concrete, uh, solid stone base, uh, the same stone as we use at AT&T, and then a kind of a candle or a faceted circle. So, and serrated, so the serrated top, not unlike the setbacks of the pre-war buildings in New York, but the round form, rather like the modern buildings with modern platonic forms. Next. Uh, this was Transco, a uh, building out in the outer regions of Houston. And you could almost um, kind of squint your eyes and see Bertram Goodhue in this, or one of the entrance to the Tribune Tower uh, uh, competition with the serrated tops and the setbacks. You can almost see Raymond Hood, the spirit of Raymond Hood in this building but it's an all glass building, a very tight skin, very vertical, very iconic. So it's in a way, to my eye, it's, it's a, it's a, it becomes a marriage of both the, the postmodern, which was much more literal in AT&T and, and the modern, which is but maybe in some ways the larger tradition. Next. And I, I think maybe we, we almost end here. This is uh, international place at Fort Hill Square on the Harbor in Boston. This is the last building that I was overseeing before I, uh, I left the office and moved back in late 83. And to me, this epitomizes very much this kind of hybridization of form. You know, you have two big round circles, drums, very modern shapes. The Bonaventure hotels were like that. They were exceedingly modern. You have a rectangle with a flat top in between. The floor plates collide and come together 
So it has the sense of being three buildings, but it's really, uh, it's actually two buildings. Uh, but if you look closely at that middle rectangle, you see a Neo-Palladian window, a tripartite window with a slip sill and little colonnettes. Do the, the round buildings have a trabeated window with a window frame, you know, echoing certain historic buildings? So the buildings are in a sense modern. At the same time, they have sort of decorative detail and historic references. Uh, so it seemed that as Philip continued to work, he was experimenting with collaging some of these, um, what had been thought to be very different, uh, uh, different arcs, really. And then I think, uh, is there one more slide here? Yeah. Oh, I think, I think Car <laughs> Carol wanted me to mention this. Uh, this is the uh, front page of the New York Times. She showed it to you a moment ago. Uh, it was the end of March. Um, I had just got back to San Francisco. I was working in San Francisco at, at the SOM office there, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill in the Alcoa building. And there was a very large 16th floor where the design department was and on the wall, those of you that have worked in architectural offices, this may sound familiar on the wall was pinup space for our drawings, but there was one end of it, which was for you know, articles from progressive architecture and award programs and newspapers. And this had been posted up the front page had been torn off and put up on the wall. And my desk was at a kind of a remove from the space. But when I came in in the morning, all the architects in the design group were huddled around this, this newspaper and they were all reading it. And I kind of went up and I looked over heads and shoulders and I sort of saw what it was. And then I began to read it and it drew my attention, not because it was there, but everybody in the office was hooting and hawing about how this was the craziest building they'd ever seen. Uh, gee, this, this is, uh, you know, this Philip Johnson guy who they were aware of really had just sort of gone off the end, just made no sense. And, you know, they, they were collectively kind of agreed on all that. And I thought I was in my mid twenties. I'm not sure what I thought, but I was uncertain that it was um, very healthy that everyone should agree on that point. And so I arranged in the next two weeks to um, pull out of the office, to depart the office. I moved to New York and I tried to get an, uh, an interview at John Johnson Bergie at the time. And it was early summer and many people were out of the office and they were wherever they are during the summer. So from July and August, I waited around and late in August, John Bergie called me and said, okay, come on into the office. And um, so I came in, they gave me a desk. There was nothing special about it. It's nothing like our desks today with, with you know, um, computers and all of that. Uh, it was flat, May lines, vellum, lead holders, all that. And um, I was put onto the team of AT&T. Uh, I was introduced to Alan. Alan was the boss of the job. He was in charge and he coordinated every, all the staff and the engineering and all of that. And I was there for a few weeks, really only, uh, did some elevator cabs and some stone detailing. And then I was carried off to um, uh, Dade County Cultural Center, another historic building that Philip and John were doing in Miami. Uh, and as, I, as he gave me the drawings and walked out of the, the studio, he said, oh yeah, he turned around, he said, by the way, the AIA is suing us. See if you can do something about that. And then he left and that was like, that was indicative of his sort of witty devilish humor that like, what could I do, I'm 26, what could I do about that? But he, the point he was making was, uh, there were a lot of people in the AIA and architecture, architecture writ large who weren't happy with the idea of going back in history and bringing forward a lot of that into buildings that they felt should continue the modernist arc. So I think with that, that kind of brings us up to these moments and I uh, welcome Alan to really talk about detail. He was the chief of this for the office. In my office and literally two blocks away is the AT&T building. And I walk past it from my apartment every day, pretty much. So. There's a lot of memories there and a lot of things that are still indelibly printed in my mind. But on the other hand, I sort of say, what, what has happened to it? Because I've seen the changes taken place and I won't comment on that, whether they're good, bad or indifferent. But this was an iconic building at the time. It was a, certainly a very important building to me because I was also a little more, a little few more years than Scott and I been in the office like five years and I'd given the assignment to to run it but that came about very strangely because uh when 
Johnson was approached to be on the short list to buy AT and T to be considered uh, for the job. Uh, the words was around that several other leading architectural firms in the in, uh, in Manhattan, such as I M Pay and I named some others, had been shortlisted. And of all things, we were the last group of, of architectural firm to be interviewed. And I heard the others had put on this grand display of breakfast and food and all sorts of things and models and and uh, drawings and images of their work. And the day before at and were coming in, I was called to upstairs. We were at two levels at that time upstairs to talk with Mr. Johnson. And he said, get me pictures of this building, this building and this building and mount them on some styrofoam board. And I said, well, what size do you want to make them? He said, oh, maybe, you know, 11 by 17, but nothing big. So I did that with my team and we put it together and I took it up in the morning and at and came in in the afternoon and I was sitting downstairs. And out of the blue, I get this call, Alan, will you come upstairs? We want to see you. So I put on, and I said, put, put on your jacket and come on up. So I put on my jacket. I went upstairs. I walked into the room and all the way around the room in his office is this baseboard and leaning up on the floor were these 10 or 12 pictures or images of buildings. And then he said, these people want to know who are going to be running this job because he said, they know I've got other jobs and I'm always busy. And I've told them, you're the man. You're the one who's going to be doing it. And literally for five years, um, I was always like night and day involved with the building. So I... I go sort of like turning the clock back, but as I say, seeing it here on the screen today and overseeing pretty much all these drawings and models, I had a very close involvement uh, with it from day one. And that carried through because literally I was also, I lived about three blocks from the AT&T site. And every day, I, my stopping off point going into the office was to go there and to work with the contractors and with the other consultants. So it was a, a very uh, illuminating experience for me. So uh, I was, I'm was i very pleased to see that it's now being recognized again. But as Scott said at the time, it was when it first got published in the newspapers, it was not that well received. And a lot of friends, architectural friends, said to me I was a traitor to modernism that I should be even involved with this a building like this but it sort of had their words quite a quite quickly afterwards because within a most likely a year 18 months uh, many other architectural firms were doing what now has become known as postmodernism. it's not really at that time that was not the the term it was called but anyway that's uh, that started to sh take shape and they quickly changed their tune. Um, the other thing was that at that time, it was an interesting uh, time uh, that because of uh, the city of New York um, had been going through a financial crisis in the five, four or five years prior to 1976 when we got the project. And so uh, this was... Fortunately, that at and had been thinking about it and had been purchasing individual sites close by. And just at about the time that they were moving forward, the city gave an incentive of tax relief on buildings. So it encouraged, it encouraged them to uh, take a, a move from their main building in downtown Manhattan to locate it here right in the middle of Manhattan on uh, Madison Avenue on 55th to 56th Street. So maybe we could move on to our next slide. This was the original rendering that you saw in the newspaper uh, that was commissioned. And I, from right day one, I worked very closely with Philip on the design aspects. And he really wanted to um, be able to express this sort of ideas that he'd been playing with uh, previously on some smaller buildings. And of course, as Scott said, people like Venturi, even, even uh, 
some of the other architects had been able to do some what quote what is now postmodernism, but only in a small way. And when uh, we got approached by the, the board of at and to do the building, uh, John de Bops, who was then the chairman of the board, turned around and said to us, he said, don't you design me another glass box? He said, I'm fed up with glass boxes. And he said, I want a building which has identity. And when I'm flying into New York, I can point down with my, my passenger below and point down and say, look, there's my building, that one that's got the hole in the top. So it really, the two blended because of Johnson eager to, to, to express these ideas of historicism and postmodernism. And but the Butts, who at and I think also uh, Scott had indicated, you know, was an anchor of, of the corporations of, of, of all corporations, was the most powerful corporation at that time in the country. And it had this sort of vision of solidarity and, you know, you could stand behind it. And I think this expression was what the Butts was looking for. So when we first presented it to the board before this was announced in the paper, um, the board members of the board were present and they were all looking at it when we unveiled it and they were all looking at it was almost in shock. And then we sat there for a few seconds, minutes, and the butt said, so what do you think? And they all sort of started. He said, you don't have to say anything. I like it and we're going to do this. This is our building. This is AT, AT and T. So as I say, there was a sort of very harmonious uh, blending of the minds of what Johnson was attempting to do. And he was looking for a big building in which he could express these ideas and the butts who wanted something which established an at and as, you know, the one of the major corporations of the uh, of uh, the United States. Let's move on, please. Some of the sketches which were presented at the uh, at the, the, the announcement meeting and when it was posted in the New York Times was the sketches of the lower portion to show how it related to the street because there was some concern that uh, all the way along Madison Avenue, which is a very narrow, one of the narrowest of avenues, that when you built right up to the to the back of the sidewalk line, and the sidewalks were not very wide either, that it actually turned out to be that uh, there was no, uh, how shall we, expansion of the street. And one of the things that uh, at t were particularly concerned about was the security of the building. It would be, though it was so well known, a, a company, there, there was a lot of discussion on how we can make this building secure and keep the, the public, you know, sort of allowing them to enter into the space, but not allowing them into the building. So the actual lobby, entry lobby of the building is quite small. And you go into that lobby and we take four uh, elevators up to the uh, first floor will be the second floor, which would it was called the sky lobby. And that was a transfer floor to take you to the remaining elevators that took you up one a low rise for the first 70 floors and the other a high rise, which went all the way up to the top, which was the 35th floor. There was 35 floors in the building. And this enabled us to, to, underneath the building, to allow the pedestrians and the public to come through and sit and eat. Behind there was an arcade, a galleria, very much based on the galleria in Milano, and that there were shops facing that to galleria. So it was really open to the public, and yet the entry restricted and gave you the security that uh, they were looking for. Next slide, please. This is the finished version of the Galleria. At, right behind, as you see, it's a, a walkthrough from 55th to 56th Street. You see the stores on either side. There was different, uh, different stores, there were some restaurants, and on the second floor of the small building at the back uh, was the AT&T uh, museum, uh, Conquest Museum, which was uh, enabled the public to see the history of the phone and how it had taken place and, and developed 
from way back in the 1920s. And you see a little bit touching on the left hand side, a circular elevator, which took the public up to that second floor. At the height of the of this arcade or galleria where it hits the building, it's 100 feet high. And you've got this sort of quarter barrel arch, which then uh, swoops down onto the roof of the of this little uh, loaf building at the at the back. Next one, please. This Carol has introduced this to me, but this is the picture of how that back galleria is today. This is a finished version of a renovation, conversion, for restoration, I don't know what you want to call it, of the new ownership of AT&T that wanted again, even open it up more to the public. So with the, they pulled down the little building at the back and created this more umbrella type roof, which is much lighter and clear. And it's, and it's very interesting. And I think uh, we'll hear more about that in future conversations. Next, please. Going back to my first rendering of this, the lower portion, this is the finished version again, the seating underneath the building, looking out onto the street. And these oculuses, as we call them, oculi, uh, enabled the light to penetrate back into the space so that it was making as much as light as air as you could possibly do it. And yet, as I say, enabled the public to wander through and enter, but at the same time, restrict the entry into the into the building itself. Next one, please. Overall image, very much today, it's very much the same from that first level up where you see there's that solid band of, of stone, but this, this hasn't changed. And basically, because when they were going through the conversion of the building or the ownership, new ownership came in, uh, a lot of people thought that this was a key building, a, a major building in the history of architecture, and it got landmarks. So the only areas which the work which could, or the building could be changed was on the lower levels, which I would have been showing you in, from previous slides. Next building, please. Next picture, please. Just an image at, at night. This was a classic picture that got illustrated many times in many magazines that to see um, city core which is to the right with the sloping top and to the left is what was now or now is another ownership but a building that was in sort of another large corporation that was in competition with at and and it was interesting because as we were designing it, each of us were trying to make the building taller I think it looks like uh, the other the other office building won out, but there was a lot of rivalry at that particular time, although much of it we had to work on together because the adjoining street had to be treated to unify the space and the connection between at ground level between the buildings. Next one, please. Lower level of the of the AT and T, as you can see here. Um, these columns which lifted the second floor up, up above the, the ground and gave the opportunity for the public to move in and flow in and out. Today, that's all enclosed for a period of time. Sony, but first of all, purchased the building from AT&T sometime, I think, in the 1994 or 5 period. And they uh, totally enclosed the whole of the ground floor and put their uh, Sony uh, store in, in there and the Sony shops were in there. And I'm sure as many people have walked by and went in to do shopping. And even at the end of the, of the gallery, that was totally enclosed as well, which I think defeated the whole idea of what we all set out to do was to, to create a building that was open for the public to, to enter in and walk through. And hopefully the new scheme, which we showed you just now, will enable us to do some of that. Some of the interesting parts of it, the stone, what the, the client really wanted was that the materials that were used on the building were local materials. So the whole of this uh, building is clad in a stone which comes from uh, Connecticut. And again, other things that really challenged us was 
there was no no buildings had been clad in like in this way with with major pieces of stone on it for maybe 20 or 30 years because when it the modern building started to develop and as we talked about scott was talking about you know the glass um enclosure stone was not used anymore and where it was used was it was made in in small thin veneers on panels and, and mounted to the building so when we came to to do all the detailing here much of this stone on the basic facade is three to four inches in thickness and the stone at the base and i'll show you that a little more uh, when we come to some of the drawings which i still have been able to uh, retain um is six inches which is very unusual for using stone and that sort of thickness and even today it's gone back more to the thinner veneers but at that particular time uh was not had not been done for many years and we had to really go out and find stone masons and stone uh, companies that could cut it to that thickness and install it the means of its installation was going back almost through classical historical ways of the turn of the century which it was so it, it was unique in many ways not only the appearance of the building but the the treatment and the materials and the detailing of the building and the other thing is once we had all that in place we needed the craftsmen to do it i mean there was not craftsmen that had done any work like this this before and when you look inside only we had plaster work where was we you know most of the of the buildings which were put up in the 60s and the 70s and the and the early 80s was sheetrock. It was a sheetrock. We did. I don't think we hardly used any sheetrock in this in this building at all. So we really stepped into the past, and I think it it opened up a lot of people's eyes. And as I said earlier, after a lot of criticism, a lot of people really appreciated this building and what it was doing to Midtown Manhattan. Next one, please. This is the front door of the building. Um, you see this arch, the lower arch is the contains the lobby. The lobby is 60 feet in height. And then the second, the circle above is the second and the third floor. The band across the middle is a bridge connecting the two sides of the building. And again, this was very unique because the whole of that window was constructed in bronze. I mean, to do that window entry today, I don't think would be possible. Uh, and it's, I mean, solid extrusions of bronze, and it was made actually in Canada, but it was the, the material was purchased from here. And as I said, all most of the materials that could be used of, from the USA were used. And if you look through, you see beyond a sculptural figure, which is standing on a pedestal, and then beyond that are the four doors that go into the elevators. And I'll talk a little bit more about those and the statue when we come to it. Next, please. This is, to, well, it looks today, we're stepping forward in time and how the window, as you see, is still there, but pretty much every other finish and cladding has been changed by the new uh, ownership and the architects that were engaged to, to do the renovation of the building. Next, please. So here's the statue, what was they called the spirit of communication. And originally this statue, it's 20, 28, 29 feet high. I think it was the second tallest uh, statue cast next to uh, the Statue of Liberty. And it was on the top of a building downtown on uh, Lower Manhattan, which was the original AT&T corporate headquarters. And the thought was that they were selling that building and the ownership that was going to take over the building wanted to trash the figure. And Philip came up with a thought, well, why can't we take that uh, statue off the top of the building and put it in this lobby, which 60 feet high, it could, it could contain many different sizes and shapes. And uh, how it was done is that they uh, had a helicopter that tight linked up all the arms and the supports to take the uh, sculpture down. And what they did is you see the golden ball at the base. 
That was on the top of the building. They cut that ball in half and lifted the statue off the building with the helicopters and took it to a foundry where it was refinished. And when it came back, the lower portion of that ball is, is just a regular, uh, I think it's just a fiberglass, made in fiberglass. They blended the two together and all the supports and the support of the legs comes down through this pedestal, which is again about 15 feet high. It's clad in black granite and quotes about AT&T on it. So um, this became a very important uh, part of the arrival to the building. And uh, in one of the statements, Philip turned around and said, look at that, look at Golden Boy standing there and wel welcoming you all. And it became the name now, or was the name of when it was still in the building of Golden Boy in the lobby of the AT&T. The floor here is all of a Spanish marble, Negra Marquina, and white uh, Carrara marble, and it was based on a traditional patterning layout from the uh, Victorian period. And the side panels are also in the same cladding as the exterior, the, uh, the, the uh, granite, and the, the upper granite is a flamed granite, and the lower granite in those arches is a polished granite. Next one, please. There's a picture of the AT&T, or uh, rather of Golden Boy, as we now call it. And you see that the again, we, we, the Oculus became a very important feature of the whole building because the sort of the cutout, partial cutout at the top. And then as I was showing you in the arcade on either side, we had the three cutouts to allow light to come in underneath the building. And this is a third one, which is based at the top of the arch of, of the of the lobby and this one is actually backlit so when you come in as you see here the the statue is silhouetted against it and the other interesting part which i was saying earlier about the uh craftsmanship that above the above the statue is an arch of we call it a handic a handy chick handy get it right in a minute but a, a, a slow slow arch that is covered totally with uh, gold leaf and uh, the cost of the gold leaf and we had to find people that were able to apply the gold leaf i went up many times during the installing of it and i was on the scaffolding and saw it put it's like small sheets of, of, of paper but it's gold and it's put on almost one piece at a time it's a very laborious uh, installation but very effective and it was very sad to me to see when the, the new ownership came in that that was taken down. And as you saw from an earlier uh, shot, which is which uh, is now the current entry lobby, uh, it's just a simple barrel arch. But I think the whole composition of this coming together was, uh, was a very important feature when we first designed it and presented it to the AT&T Corporation. Next one, please. I take a few shots of the interior of the building. Uh, again, you can see how the classicism, this is almost like a, a Victorian, but this is the boardroom. It, the table is 36 feet in length. And uh, again, you can see the plaster ceilings. All this was done with plaster, molded plaster and frame all by, by craftsmen that we used to say we had to search the country to find people that were capable of doing this type of work. And it's a, it was a fantastic job and very interesting to be a participant in it. Next one, please. This is the what we call the sky lobby. When you were seeing the images from the exterior and you saw that upper circular window, this is where you can see the bridge making the connection between the two sides. And when you stepped off of the elevator here, you were greeted. This was as far as the visitors could go. And then somebody would come down to, to meet you and then take you to one of the uh, meeting rooms or on the other one, the right hand side, there was actual fact a lounge where you could sit and eat and, and, uh, and talk to, to visitors. This was all done in Carrara marble, a cala, which is called Calacata marble. And uh, it, the whole of the surface was all, all done, finished in this marble. 
I was fortunate enough to go to it a number of times to select the marble and lay it out and see how it would be set in uh, mock-ups over there. So when it came here, immediately could be installed in the format that you see it. Next one, please. And this is an, same, the same marble. On the top three levels are the uh, executive floors, and they were linked together with this grand staircase, which was quite some feat because of the structure. It literally spanned from one side of this window to the other. And in fact, even the, the mullions of the window were tied to it. So the sort of partly the mullions were supporting the stair and partly the stair was supporting the mullions, which was quite an engineering feat. Next one, please. This is again off the, off the uh, sky lobby and a similar type of stair. And you can see beyond the lounge with the game, we picked up these sort of vaulted ceilings. Uh, so there was a theme which was sort of running through the whole of the design to keep it very consistent and simple, but still introducing a lot of historical detailing and materials which had not been, as I say, used from, for many, many years. Next one, please. Here's the inside of that lounge on the second floor. And uh, again, this is this handkerchief vault and all the wood paneling, you see the wood paneling is has a lot of similarities to it here on this lounge level. And when you look at it in the uh, room at the top, the boardroom on the top floor. Next one. Now we put in some, for the, for the architects, we put in some drawings which were produced at that time, a number of them which I was very involved with and, and, and drew myself. And I just just quickly, sort of, this is the ground floor. It says, you see on the lower portion is Madison Avenue and then the two sides, 55, 56, then the Galleria portion that runs through uh, above that. And then that small building at the back, which is restaurants and as I say, the InfoQuest uh, Center for at and but you see how small the lobby is and how it's restricted for the public to enter into it. Right in the middle, middle you can see the uh, view or plan view of the sculpture. But you see with the columns and lifting that, that the sort of ceiling of that ground level, you see how open it is that people can wander through and it's, it's totally accessible. And that enabled, I think, a lot of the early criticism of making the sidewalk and Madison Square, uh, Madison Avenue so small or thin that now it basically Madison Avenue extends all the way back almost to 120 feet back until it hits the hits the small building at, and on the west side of the site. Next one, please. This is the lounge, which we were on the, on the second floor, sky lobby floor. You can see in the middle, that's the sky lobby, the four elevators at the back where you get off those elevators and then you walk through, you get uh, uh, greeted and you walk through and you go to either side from that uh, bridge area to the right side, which is the low rise bank of elevators, six elevators that take you up the first 17 floors and then on the uh, left side is the high rise bank of elevators and then to the left it totally still is the layout of that little lounge area which I showed you just a couple of slides back with the uh, handkerchief sort of vaulted ceiling and on the other side our board to our me meeting rooms rather in a boardroom. Next one please. This is a typical floor pretty much from uh, four through to 32, these are all typical office floors for uh, people working for at and There was a lot of flexibility. It was one of the first raised floors that were put in so that you could run all the power and circuitry, electrical circuitry below the floor. Um, very spacious in, in its own way because all these little smaller stations inboard from the offices were just low stations so you had a lot of openness it also opened at either end to the to light and, and, and air and you can see in this one this is the low rise area where you've got the four or six elevators on the uh, on the right hand side next one please 
This is now some details, drawings of which we actual fact uh, were working drawings from which the building was constructed from. Uh, this is that main arch which we were I was showing you earlier, and you can sort of see a, a section through that arch which says AA. You can sort of see how thick the stone on that piece is on the left hand. I'm sorry, on the right hand side are over six inches, and then the other sides right to the lower portion of the drawing and to the left of the drawing are four inch pieces of stone so you could sort of see this was very unique and look even the the actual roll of the stone the the, the ribbing of the stone on either side how thick those that's solid pieces of stone which was very unique to be doing that uh, at this particular time next one please there you can blow ups of those and you can see that's all solid stone uh, cut in uh, most of it was cut here in the in the states but interestingly because the volume of stone that was needed the quarry could not handle it all and it's actually blocks of stone were sent to Italy and that's the flat what you call the flat work the small thinner stone was all produced and cut in in Italy and then shipped back over here and uh, again I went there many times to to the to the stone uh, factory to see how this was being cut and, and uh, proportioned and then the way it would be shipped next one please this is the famous oculus or as it became known later as the chippendale top which i would never dare say that in front of philip but he would always <laughs> he would hated that term but i mean it is obviously reminiscent of uh, Chippendale furniture and clocks which did have the cutout top and again you can see the complexity of the detail of how that whole stone of the coping stone the fascia stone was all pieced together and supported off of these angles and uh, steel uh, beams and the, off the concrete floor of the of the roof next one please I think I'm running uh, we should move quickly because I think I've eaten up my time. But this was the actual groundbreaking ceremony, which would happened right in obviously in the site. Uh, members of the AT and T board, also members of of the contracting company, and there's one other person. If you look for the second from right, is me in 34 years or what it was ago. I hope. It gives you some ideas of what we had to confront of how important that building, iconic this building was and what it did to change and get people to think about uh, historical buildings and texture and how it fat, uh, fitted in with the surroundings of uh, Midtown Manhattan. So um, thank you for listening and uh, I'll pass you back to Carol. Well, that was fantastic, Alan, um, and Scott as well. But uh, Alan, you, you you brought us there right into uh, into the room and uh, onto the street and into the elevator and everything. Um, I'm going to leave uh, the screen again, and I think since we are at seven o'clock, but I think if we take you know eight or ten minutes of uh, of conversation, but I, let me just interject one of the questions because Alan, you did check off all the bullet points of the questions that I asked you in uh, in my email. I tried um, hard. <laughs> say, um, say for one that I'd like to hear a little more about, and because we showed the Seagram building, you talked about the office, but I don't think that everybody knows that your office was in the Seagram building. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and there was an upstairs downstairs relationship that you talked about uh, in terms of the production and uh, Philip Johnson's office. So uh, perhaps you and Scott could talk a little bit about how the office was organized, how the work was produced, the drawings. You've described how you you were the author um, uh, you, or the draftsman, um, Alan, of some of those drawings. Was I, And I don't know the answer to this question. Was there an architect of record that you collaborated with or what did everything come out of the Johnson Berge office. And I'm going to uh, leave the screen. Literally, that was everything was produced in the office. Uh, when we got the job, uh, the only thing which I was actually going to bring up is that AT&T sort of being the sort of consciousness of correctness, whatever you want to call it as a statement for it, is that they wanted us to team up with a minority firm. Actually, the minority firm was almost in name alone. I don't want to be rude, but they did not really contribute very much to the production of the work 
Um, we had one person from that firm that was in the office under my direction. I had a team of about eight people off and on during the course of the job. And the office was located on two floors at the top of the building on the 37th and 36th floor. I was on the 36th floor and uh, it was split into teams and pretty much there was one interesting thing is although it was a fairly large office, we only had maybe four jobs, maybe five jobs, Scott knows more accurate than I am, of happening at the same time. So there was either associate partners, I would later became an associate partner and then a partner, but at that time I was a associate and the project manager. And so basically there was those four people, maybe two or three on the lower level and two or three on the upper level that ran the projects and reported directly to, to Johnson and Begee. Yeah, I think, Alan, if I can add, I don't believe that there was any particular meaning or hierarchy to the floors, although the entrance no, was on the, up, the upper floor, 37, right. and John and Philip's office was uh, on that floor. And frequently when a project was in early concept development, it would start on the 37th floor only because Philip's office was on there and he could run back and forth without having going down that winding staircase, yeah, yeah. which was a little, <laughs> little bit rickety. Um, and then it would move to wherever the job, wherever the team was uh, uh, in the office. And it was, you know, it was pre-computer, as Alan would know. Yes. It was uh, flat tables and uh, mylar and may lines and all of that. Um, yeah, so I think that was common. We all had friends at, uh, you know, in Pay's office and Guafami's office and SOM. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much uh, all the same. And they did have a great view of the East River, I will say that. Well, it was a nice building to be in. I mean, again, an iconic building. So I came from England and very shortly after I arrived, I got introduced to Mr. Johnson and he asked me to join him, which I was sort of flabbergasted. Here's this kid from England coming over and being asked to work in, you know, one of the top architectural offices in the world. But the the hierarchy, as you say, was it was not really that way. Johnson was on the on the 37th floor, but that's when I said earlier, when you call me, put on your coat and come upstairs and see me. So that's <laughs> how it arrived. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was a lovely thing to be working in a Seagram's building because you're always looking at the details and the travertine floors mm. and you were looking at the elevator cab interiors and it was Cambridge metals and you just, you know, you could <laughs> pluck all the stuff off. And we did have a model shop, which was in the basement underneath the Four oh, Seasons yes, restaurant. So, so Joe was in his uh, lab coat underneath and we take the back service stair to go down and see Joe and see how the models were working out. And one of, um, one of Philip's jokes that he told more than once, I can say, was he said that, well, the part that he contributed to Mises building was the curtains because the, uh, the yes, level or okay. the shun sun shades, they, Mises required they be in thirds that you could, you couldn't stop them except at specific third points, either up one third down, two thirds down, or all the way down to the radiator, nothing in between. And he said, Philip said, I kind of goofed that up and it doesn't really work very well. And that, that was the humor of it, but it did, it did show the amount of rigor that went into that building which by the way, as Alan was talking about the storefronts in bronze, that whole building is in bronze. Mm -hmm. uh, right. it, yeah, yeah, it had to be, it basically had to be waxed every year or two just to keep it from corroding. So uh, in a way like AT&T in its time, Seagram's was the, the real deal. And I, and I would add to uh, what Alan was talking about, four and six inch stone, you should try to pick up a piece in your hand of four to six inch stone. You can't do it. We normally have to work with two and three centimeters, which is three quarters inch to an inch and a quarter. And um, and in the wake of AT and T, which did it in such elaboration and in such authenticity, a lot of the buildings, the postmodern buildings that followed, had to begin the logic, the internal logic of steel frame cladding was to thin, 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 less weight, lighter, easier to erect. And so you had in the wake of AT and T, a lot of buildings that didn't have that kind of richness and that depth. Uh, and that was really just the kind of the logic of the building type in a way, for better and worse. And the irony of this, of you know, what you're saying, the structure and everything else was here we designed this building, which was like a fortress. And one of the first questions we got asked is, 
if a Volkswagen a car filled up with bombs was parked against one of the columns at the base and it exploded and the column was blown out, what would happen? Nothing would happen. We had to go back and prove it and had our structural engineer who happened to be Leslie, Leslie Robertson, who Carol knows very well, uh, he had to go there and, and prove to the board that if that if a car didn't have to do that, that the column, one column or even two columns, the building would still stand up. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I would add one last thought, uh, and that is that um, on the critical review side, remember that article in March of 1978, that was written by Ada Louise Huxtable, who was the main architectural critic for the Times at that time. And she was uh, provisional about it, very important building, we'll have to see. Paul Goldberger wrote several articles for the New York Times, he was also a critic, and he was positive on some elements, uncertain on other elements. Uh, Robert Hughes of Time Magazine was generally positive, although he had a lot to say before he got positive. And Michael Sorkin, who a village voice said it was terrible, it was awful. Um, so there was a real strong diversity of opinion. There was a lot of uh, second guessing and uncertainty. Um, and yet, despite all of that, and there was frankly a lot of inertia on the part of the profession uh, but notwithstanding that, it was 1978, it was the year it was really that Alan was beginning to build it, that, um, uh, that Philip got the gold medal. And uh, if you remember that, or maybe some of you might remember that famous picture of him getting the AIA gold medal, he had a dozen architects around him. He had Charles Moore, he had uh, Bob Stern, uh, he had Frank Gehry. Uh, he had people who were doing other things in the modern movement. He used this moment to sort of expand the language of possibility. And then in 1979, I believe it was, he was the first Pritzker Prize winner. So even with all of this um, criticism and contradictory uh, concern, provisional attitudes about it, even unfortunate uh, criticism, uh, there was a, clearly a sense it was an important moment. And he had made that moment happen. We have touched on an inexhaustible subject, <laughs> I believe. Um, but Scott, you wrapped it up very well, I, I think, in suggesting that the um, that the critics receive things differently than the than some of the architects. But there are the polarities in the way the architectural community them, themselves were split over embracing these ideas of. Um, of theoretical postmodernism or um, decorative uh, uh, post return to to decoration and appreciation of materi materiality, uh, which is something that Alan you uh, have expressed or illuminated very well in the discussion of the the stonework and all of the detailing. So um, this is a building that has now changed. Um, so I'm really so pleased that we could have brought the two of you together in order to get both your reflections and then now your perspective um, on the importance of the building. And again, there's so much more to say. Um, certainly much has been said about Philip Johnson um, and uh, you know his politics, his life in these, these, la these last few years, and he remains an enormously controversial feature. But to hear the both of you reflect on what it was like to work with him on, on such uh, a, an extraordinary and important commission, um, we really thank you for going um, on the record and making some history tonight in, in order to preserve the history of the building. So. Um, thank you so much for joining us. The, this will be a video on the museum's archive, and we'll we're going to hope to explore the um, the current design and the reinvention in the 21st century design of um, AT and T Sony Building now 550 Madison Avenue in yet another program. So we continue to honor the history and also to march forward uh, into uh, the 21st century. And so um, thanks. Thanks so much, um, Alan and Scott, for being with Thank us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.